It's time now for me to introduce my fabulous panel, who will be reacting to the big stories of the day and looking at tomorrow's newspaper front pages. Broadcaster and journalist, very old friend of mine, Benedict Spence. Writer, photographer, filmmaker and author of the best-selling State of Fear, Laura Dodsworth. And the fabulous political commentator and broadcaster, Jason Reed. Jason, we'll start with you. Welcome to the show. Uh, what did you make of Labour's conference this year? Was it a hit or a fail? I, I must admit, I tuned out quite early from uh, Keir Starmer's speech and I'm glad I did because it sounds like it just never ended. Keir Starmer is in a difficult position, but he's got to work out what kind of Labour leader he wants to be before he can start pitching himself to the country as a future Prime Minister. He knows full well that there's not a general election around the corner, so I think he took this conference as an opportunity to fight some internal battles. He's fighting against the unions, he's fighting against the left of his party, he was trying to change the way in which Labour leaders are elected, that kind of thing, which doesn't really matter to the country at large, but matters a huge amount to the people within the Labour Party. And we know that the Labour Party loves nothing more than talking about the Labour Party. But it seems like he's a very, very long way from being a credible candidate to be Prime Minister, just because of the electoral maths, if nothing else. The 2019 election was less than two years ago with that huge 80-seat victory for the Tories. No party in, in recent political history has overcome that kind of deficit in one electoral cycle. So Keir Starmer has quite a task on his hands. I think the question should be whether he can stay as Labour leader after the next election defeat, not whether he can win the next election. Laura. Now, Jason, uh, do you think that we are days or weeks away from this petrol crisis ending? I think we probably are. I think there's, there's a degree of truth in the allegation that the government has been gaslighting us about the seriousness of this. If you think back to another recent example with the, the toilet paper shortage last year, you can see how that spirals out of control because people just keep buying toilet paper and filled up their houses with it. Whereas with fuel, once you've filled up your car, mm. and maybe a couple of jugs if you're really keen, there's not really much more you can do once you've actually, until you've actually used the fuel and you need to buy more. So it seems like the kind of thing that will just blow over in a few days' time. Uh, Jason, are we over the idea that the petrol crisis and indeed empty supermarket shelves is Brexit related? Can we just kill that canard now for good? I hope we are. I hope we're past the days where every positive news story has to be preceded by the words, despite Brexit. Um, I think we are, we are past those days. If anything, if nothing else, just because we're, we're fed up of talking about Brexit, which is very understandable. Jason, the public are running out of patience. They are, but at the same time, I think there's a a little bit of uh, nuance to be had here, even if it's, it's not so much in fashion, because I don't really want to live in the kind of country where the police crack down brutally on uh, people ex uh, using their democratic right to protest. I think it's pretty clear to most people now that into Lake Britain are perhaps not the brightest bunch when it comes to the environmental policy debate, but at the same time, uh, there's a balance to be found between uh, making sure that we make sure we uh, retain our freedom to protest as well. And therefore, if there's a culture of misogyny and sexism, you cannot say that, uh, that this monster is, uh, is a sort of, as we say, you know, a one-off, because you've got a wider culture. Big, big concern. I mean, final thoughts on this, Jason, what do you think? It's absolutely amazing, in the worst possible way that Cressida Dick is still in her job, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. The first uh, thing that could have happened in order to signal that some real change is going to take place would have been her resigning and that's of course not happened. In the aftermath of Harold Shipman, who I think it's fair to say in that case it was a, a one-off bad apple scenario and palliative care changed, the culture of it changed dramatically afterwards. But there aren't any signs of the culture of what's going on in the police, of nicknaming someone the rapist, of um, not acting on allegations of indecent exposure, of this kind of implicit tolerance of misogyny and sexual assault, there aren't any signs I can see that that's going to change anytime soon, which means there will be more Sarah Everards to come. Lament. Well, Jason, I know that you got your eyebrows threaded before you came out tonight. Naturally. Looking fabulous. Thank you. And designer stubble. Of course. Of course. But I mean, isn't this a little petty? What's to stop a 17 year old having a bit of an eyebrow thread or a bit of Botox? I agree with you. I don't know if it's useful or helpful to anyone for the government to be coming in and setting these arbitrary limits about on your 18th birthday you're allowed to have Botox but a week before that you're far too immature. I know lots of 
fully grown adults who, with the best will in the world, are a lot less mature than my 16-year-old brother. Um, my concern with this kind of policy is that it's going to push, it's going to be a boon for people who are selling perhaps slightly dodgy home Botox kits on Definitely. the internet. You're going to have backstreet Botox. Exactly. Which sounds like a band, doesn't it? It does a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we should be regulating this kind of thing. We should be making sure that uh, 16 and 17 year olds who want to have their lips, lip filler done or whatever, it's done safely, it's done above board by a licensed professional using properly regulated mm. products. We don't want to be fueling the dark market, the illegal market with this kind of thing. Uh, mm. But of course, Jason, someone's going to have to gently break it to the Australian government that whilst the vaccine may be helpful, in preventing uh, the worst hospitalizations and tragic COVID deaths, that having the jab won't stop you catching COVID or passing it on. So this zero COVID policy is a disaster and they're on a hiding to nothing. Well, what we're seeing is um, there's a particularly bad case of this in Australia, of course, as we've been talking about, but this is a common thread around the world that civil liberties are being rolled back in a way we've we've never really seen before because of this unprecedented once in a lifetime pandemic and the concern is that as you say we don't know how it ends um, and so I know there's been some donations of so I believe it was Pfizer vaccine doses from the British government and from others you mentioned Sophie that the vaccination rates are now increasing at quite a pace do you think it would help if there were more donations from uh, from around the world rather than for example uh, jabbing kids in this country if we were to give more doses to adults who want it in Australia, would that help to speed up the end of this situation? Well, we've been told that we now have ample supply. We had AstraZeneca being produced here in Melbourne. We uh, obviously had that uh, very helping hand from the UK to give us Pfizer doses. Uh, we've been told a lot of mixed messages though. One day we're told there's not enough vaccine, then we're told there's plenty of vaccine, then we're told there's lots of bookings uh, that aren't filled, but then we're also told that there's protesters booking vaccines who are wanting their freedom and they're not showing up. So then these doses go to waste. Let's watch. How about you, Jason? <laughs> um, did you get the inclusive car parking space at GB News? I didn't. For uh, legendary panel members. I thought it was going to be... With your, your name <laughs> in gold lettering. <laughs> Listen, you are just days away from your own parking space here at GB News. But, I mean, what, what is your reaction to this story? Because, I mean, I'm surprised it's happened in Germany because I didn't realise that Germany was awash with this sort of ultra-PC nonsense. I didn't realise that the problem with, uh, with homophobia was that gay people can't <coughs> find places to park. I don't know what problem is being solved <laughs> by this... Um, my concern is that this kind of virtue signalling distracts from the real issues, right? If you're... Um, this local councillor in Germany and you really want to be uh, doing your bit, then maybe you should be uh, fighting for more rights to work for asylum seekers or for better sexual health provisions, things like that, painting rainbows on things. I don't think it really achieves anything. I think it might act actually be actively bad because it distracts and undermines from real problems in the world. And it's quite patronising as well. You've got nothing to complain about now because we've painted a rainbow on that wall. Thing. I, I mean, Jason, uh, Laura raises a good point, which is that every month of the calendar has been ruined now with some thing that you've got to do, like grow a beard or go vegan or do a triathlon. I mean, it's a lot of virtue signalling, isn't it? It is. I'm not a fan of this misery guts. You know, you're trying to enjoy a drink and someone comes along and says, have you thought about the health implications of that? There's nothing wrong with a glass of wine with dinner and a gin in the afternoon and a beer at lunch and a Bloody Mary with breakfast as well. <laughs> live and let live. You've just described my perfect day. But look, don't take way to speak. So on that note, we thought we would play a game tonight to test our knowledge of slang words. And we're calling it Slang in Match. That's right, this show isn't just thrown together. So for my panel, I've got several slang expressions in this game of Slang in Match, and I want you to tell me what they mean. So first of all... Doylem. So, for example, you'd say, oh, he's a proper doylem, is Dan. Oh, by the way, I don't like that, because that could be about Dan Wooten, who's a legend. So it could be another name, like Steve or Bob. But he's a proper doylem. What is doylem, panel? It's a retro <laughs> one, isn't it? I think it just means an idiot. It does mean an idiot. It's the right answer. And is that, going, is that rolling back the years, yeah? Is that a vintage slang? I think so. it sounds kind of old-fashioned. I thought it sounded, it sounded it sounds Yiddish. Bit, I've got sounds to be a bit clockwork with. orange or something. I... Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, 
Let's now talk about our Greatest Britain and Union jackass. And uh, this is when my panel nominates someone that's been brilliant this week and someone that's been quite the opposite. We've only got a few seconds because of all the slang. So, Jason, give us your Greatest Britain. My Greatest Britain is perhaps an odd choice, but the, the new co-leaders of the Green Party, because they, as I understand it from the Green Party's internal election, they were the moderate candidates. They reject the radical politics of Extinction Rebellion and of Insulate Britain. Mm. And so it seems like we might, we might have a more positive environmental debate with a more moderate, sensible Green Party, as opposed to some of the other candidates. So I understand one of them was a founding member of Extinction Rebellion, so it could have been a lot worse. Well, it was great hearing about the German Green Party, who are quite centrist and quite sensible, and uh, even, dare I say it, electable. You know, we can only dream of such a political movement in this country. Right, briefly then, your union jackass, Jason. My union jackass is Public Health England, which at long last has been abolished this week. The nanny state central, the regulatory body that wants to police every aspect of our lives. They want sugar taxes to make the poor poorer. They want to regulate our alcohol consumption. They want to stop us smoking. They want to stop vaping. They want to stop gambling. And now we can only hope that for the future it will not be replaced by something even worse. But for now we can celebrate the demise that's long overdue of this, uh, of this body that never helped anyone. Well, and, rid of and as a country, we have gotten sicker uh, on, under the auspices of, auspices of and, and on the watch of Public Health England, so they won't be missed. Um,